do you stop, though? I have thought about that. We know so little. And I wondered, is it possible? Would it be possible? Under those circumstances, as intense and as intuitive as he obviously was, could he stop? And we know so little about the behavior patterns of persons on a, who commit serial murder. I mean, on a grand scale. I mean, you don't, it's not like you go to a, uh, you're a behavioral scientist and you can just invite a whole bunch of people into a room and have them fill out questionnaires. I mean, there's just so much that's unknown. But I think it's, it's, I don't think it's inconceivable that that could happen. I don't think it's inconceivable. Just as people change behavior drastically and transform and are transformed for whatever reason, whether they live lives with their alcoholics or uh, whatever their personal problem might be, I think we see there are at their instances in life that we all have seen where people have had serious problems and just came to grips with them and dealt with them and stopped. Now, most people aren't able to do that, but I agree. I mean, most people just go on until, you know, they're arrested or, you know, they're alcoholics or, you know, they lose their job or they get a divorce or some crisis happens in their lives. But there are people, I think, who are capable, for whatever reason, of, of facing up to, you know, the, the, their, uh, the difficulties they're having in the, the distortions of their, their minds and uh, reforming themselves. I think this is highly unlikely, you know, but I don't think it's inconceivable. But again, you're dealing, we don't, you, don't, you just don't know. <laughs> it, would be a, it, it would be extraordinary if, if someday you found out this guy just stopped. You know. but, uh, Speak in terms of equating it like with alcoholism, which may not be like an escape or whatever for the people and it's difficult for them to overcome it but occasionally they can and like a serial murder at least from my own personal perception of the Green River case and some others like it appears to be a crime of crime behavior activity whatever almost a, a power and I would use the word possession total possession you know I mean that's the way I perceive people who are serial murderers whom we would term organized so to speak and you're certainly familiar with it how we categorize people. Uh, can't envision what goes on in their mind when they're actually controlling and killing, okay, and whatever else may or may not be involved, whether it be uh, playing out a sexual fantasy or exploration or whatever, but the actual being there at the moment that life is gone, it, to me it's almost like a total possession. That, that person would be mine. No one else in the world could control that person. There's nothing that person can do anymore for themselves. Totally in my hands. Okay. They left this earth in my hands. They had no choice. No one could stop me at that particular time. I can only imagine that it's almost, a, in a sinister way, a society would look at it, but almost a euphoric feeling. And a person that's so active as this guy has been, if he is due the credit that has been given to him, I, I can't think of anyone else in our society uh, who has been basically given credit for that many in that short period of time. Uh, it, it must be just uh, a tremendous drive, uh, almost a need for this feeling of possession. I, I don't think it's so much to just eliminate a, a life. I mean, you, there were easier victims for him to find. Prostitutes are certainly high. Uh, and highly visible, but he could have taken children, uh, could have taken elderly people or something like that in another way. But uh, the ones he was, was choosing, basically, a very spirited type of folks, they're out going. Uh, they're out on the streets constantly dealing with other people. And it's a challenge for him. They're going to fight back a little bit, but he just totally controlled them. And I, and I just wonder if to me, I just can't equate it so much with like alcoholism or a habit or something. Can you actually get that out of your system? I mean, is, is that possible to stop? I mean, that's been one of the real big burning questions for us. You know, we look at ages, of course, and activity. Does, does a person like this start to burn out at some point? Uh, or what? I, I don't know what you're... You're, you're... I think 
you're, you're right on in, in your questions. I, I can understand. I'm asking an awful lot of questions. No, sure, I, can, <laughs> I, I can see where your mind's going, and I can I, I see that you're probing and you're trying to understand, and you're dealing, you know, within um, with some very important kinds of issues and concepts. Uh, but don't tell yourself short. You can understand. Okay, you can understand because in, in your own way. There are things in your own life you experience that kind of intensity and that kind of a power. Maybe you have problems or anybody has problems they can't control. And I don't mean to demean or to diminish the seriousness of what what happened, say, in the Green River case. It was obviously a very serious and tragic situation, but to that person who's doing it, it makes sense at the time. And who knows what all the emotions and the passions and the mental... Uh, images that are rushing through his mind before, during, and after. This is, of course, extremely important from uh, both a, 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 a behavioral scientist's point of view and a law enforcement's point of view. But you can begin to get inside this man's head if you, if you try to use personal experiences as, as a guide to a certain extent. And I guess there's no way to know precisely what he thought or what he did until he tells you. And I think sometimes I could see myself trying to figure out what's going through the Green River killer's head to the point where I was just driving myself nuts. Why? Why this and not that? Why prostitutes and not children or old people? Why the river? Why the mountains? You know. Now you know what a profile goes sure. through. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I, you, you just don't have the, the data to make those kinds of decisions. For instance, let me give you an idea. When I was talking to Bob Keppel, they said, do you think this guy would keep the stuff he's taking from the victims, you know, the personal possessions that apparently you weren't finding any? I said, well, yeah, maybe, maybe not. But you don't know. You don't have any information really to say for sure one way or the other. And if, if you have a hot suspect and he doesn't have anything, that doesn't mean he's not the person. On the other hand, if you have a hot su suspect and you search his apartment, you find lockers full of stuff, well, you got his, you've got him, right? So it doesn't really, it, it's, an important, it's an important thing to keep in mind, but don't torture yourselves over it because there's no way to know. You have no information. The one interesting thing they did find, that they, they said, you know, we found a couple miles away from the site where this victim was found, they found a driver's license. What, did, what do you think was happening there? Were they fighting? This is what they told me, and I don't know if they were being straight with me. Uh, this was the, one of the victims named Kimmy Pitts or something. It was found in the Kent Valley. We found her driver's license over here, you know, on uh, the side of the freeway. What was going on? I said, well, I don't know. But, I doubt, you know, I seriously doubt they were fighting. I don't think very, very many of these victims had a chance to fight with the guy. He was very, very efficient at whatever he was doing. I mean, this is a, this is rather, really the extraordinary accomplishment, if you want to look at it, of, of this particular individual that nobody that would, that anybody knows of that I, that I am aware of got away from him. And considering the streetwise nature of the people he's up against, it's quite 